All right, I want to get something out of the way really quickly because if you don't typically go to church, you just experience something on a Sunday morning that, quite frankly, I find a little bit weird. Okay, so just, let's just get this out of the way at the beginning of the talk. Um, mostly, at least in my country, I don't know what it's like here in the UK, it normally takes a couple of beers on a Friday or a Saturday night for a group of people to come into a room like this and sing at the top of their lungs before 10 o'clock in the morning. I don't know if that's normal here in the UK, but that's not normal in Australia. So if you're not a church person and you've come in and you've gone, what the heck, these people are really over the top excited before breakfast on a Sunday morning to sing at the top of their lungs. I just want to let you know, I think that's a little strange as well. That's a bit weird. In fact, you know what's even more weird is people are so excited that they actually are like fist pumping. I was one of them, fist pumping down the front row here. And maybe you're wondering, as you were watching the guy on the guitar here a moment ago, I was actually wondering if he had like a question about the song during the song, because he had his hand up, which made it really hard for me to figure out how he was actually playing the guitar. I don't know how that works, but maybe you're here this morning and your experience is not normally on a Sunday morning to walk into a building like this and sing at the top of your lungs. Maybe you're here because somebody told you, there's like really cute girls that go to this church, or maybe they promised you a free lunch after church. I don't know how you landed here, but here's what I want you to know. You are in a very safe place if church is not a part of your normal routine. And I just want to explain a little something to you. There was a song that we sang a couple of moments ago that talked about how God does good things. And that's the reason why people get up on a Sunday morning without any beers, walk into a room and celebrate because they've experienced the good things that God has done in their life. And on top of that, there was another line in that same song that said this, and I think you'll, do, I believe you'll do good things again. And that's part of the reason we come into a room like this on a Sunday morning and sing at the top of our lungs, because some of us, myself included, need to be reminded and need to remind ourselves on a regular basis that God has done good things in our life in the past, but we desperately need to see him do those good things again. And songs like we just sung remind us of that truth. So I don't know what your church experience is like. Maybe this is your first time ever in church or first time in a long time in church. You just need to know you're in a great place to experience what it means to continue or begin to follow Jesus and to explore what good things God has in store for your life. You're in a great place to be able to do that. Now, I'd love to get to know you as an as a audience this morning. And by way of doing that, uh, there's a way that I'd like to do that this morning. I'd love it if you would take out your phone. I want to do a quick survey of who's in the room this morning, okay? You can go ahead and grab your phone. Some of you have already been on your phone. Now you've got a good excuse to have your phone out. Nobody will wonder why you were on Instagram. It's totally fine if you were checking Instagram. I was actually checking the scores of a huge rugby league game going on right now as we speak in Australia. So it's no judgment here if you got your phone out. Here's the survey that I'd love for you to do. You may have to, if you're up the back, zoom in a little bit, but I'd love for you to click on this little QR code and take a quick survey for me. And the survey is all about airplanes. Now, I had to take, not what Chris said this morning, a flight today. I took it a couple of weeks ago to get here to the UK. But I ended up taking a flight that took me 22 hours to get here. 20 of those, uh, sorry, yeah, 22 hours, but eight of the hours, 30 total, uh, were spent in Singapore. There's a little layover there of eight hours in Singapore, which was beautiful, by the way. But I'd love to find out if you've ever been on an airplane, that's the first question. Whether you've been on the airplane or not, you can take the survey. The second question is this, what's your favorite or least favorite part of flying? I don't know what it is for you. For me personally, I love the takeoff. That's my favorite part of flying. My least favorite part is the taxi at the end. I'm not a huge fan of waiting for the gate to be opened in order for our plane to get in there. I always think to myself when they tell us that we've landed and we're gonna be taxiing for a little while because our gate's not available, I always wonder to myself, did they not know that this plane was coming? That seems a little concerning, that they weren't prepared that we were landing. Next question is this. When it comes to 2022, this year, 
how would you describe what it was like for you if it was a flight? Would you say that it's been smooth? Hopefully nobody's saying number six here, crashed and burned. Hopefully it's been something else other than that. Maybe it's been climbing for you or perhaps it's been some turning points for you. It's kind of like you've been banking quite a bit throughout this year. The next question I would love to ask you or have you respond to is what kind of flight do you hope for over the next year? What are you hoping for over the next year? Is it something you're hoping perhaps that you would begin climbing over the next year? The next question about flying is this in the survey, and this is one of my favorites. Which question is asked the most by passengers on an airplane? Number one, where are we flying over right now? Flight attendants love that question because they have absolutely no idea when you ask that question. Where they look at you and say, I have no idea. I'm, I'm just your flight attendant. This one, why is your seatbelt different from ours? Have you ever noticed that? Flight attendants have like a four-point harness on their seatbelt, and we just have like the little lap belt that would barely keep you in the seat if we had an accident. Number three, can you help me with my bag? Number four, can I change my seat? This one's super important, especially on long flights. How do I flush? And then one of the questions I actually asked on the flight from Singapore here to London was this one. Do you have a small SIM, a SIM eject tool for my, my mobile phone? And oftentimes they'll pull their earring out and give it to you and you pop that SIM card out. Here's the answer to this question, if you're wondering. The most asked question to flight attendants on a flight is this one right here. Can I change my seat? That's the number one question. Now, when I get on a plane, I don't know if you're like this when you get on a plane, but when I get on a flight, I love to ask questions of the people that are sitting next to me. And the first question I always ask is this question, are you coming or going? Are you coming or going? Because whether a person is coming or going answers a lot of questions. It actually tells you a lot about that person and begins a conversation. And so if you're a person that loves to get on the plane and not talk to anybody, make sure you're not sitting next to me because I love asking questions. People oftentimes will put their AirPods in pretty quickly after they sit next to me on a plane, especially after this question. But here's the question I get asked the most when I'm flying. What do you do? I get asked that question almost every time I sit down on a flight. People will say to me, oh, from your accent, I can tell you're not from here. And then they'll ask me, so what is it that you do? Because of what I do, when I begin to explain to them what I do, it's amazing how sometimes their vernacular changes a little bit as I begin to explain to them. I travel around the world and I speak in churches and so on. But these questions that we're looking at this morning that oftentimes get asked when you're on a flight, these questions, I think, reflect something about our society that I want us to talk about and I want us to really dive deep into this morning. Here's what it reflects. It reflects that we live in an externally focused culture. People are constantly interested in what other people do or maybe what you do. They're interested in what people have and they're interested in what other people think and say about them. I don't know if you would say that Finch Hampstead is an externally focused culture or not, but even in the short time that I've been here driving around the area, I've discovered that even Finch Hampstead is a place where the culture and the society thinks a lot about these questions. What do you do? What do you have? And what do other people think or say about you? Now, some of you in the room this morning might say, you know what, Jason, I'm not sure if I completely agree with this, that we all live in an externally focused culture. Well, here's what I want to ask you this morning. Think about this morning, just a couple of hours ago when you got out of bed, what did you wake up thinking about this morning? When you think about this morning, you first woke up, did you think about something that you had to do today? Did you think about something that you have on your schedule today or something that you have to take care of today? And perhaps like me and many other people around the world, you picked up your phone to check what other people think and say about you, perhaps on social media or some other platform on your mobile phone. We live in an extremely externally focused culture and society. And here's what you need to know. If you're a church person, 
I want you to lean in just for a moment. If you're not a church person, you can kind of take a break from the conversation for a moment. I'll tell you in a couple of minutes when you can check back into the conversation. But if you're not a church person, you can have a break for a moment. All the church people, you consider yourself a church person. I want you to lean in for a moment because I'd like for us to have a private conversation just for a moment where we can be brutally honest about this externally focused culture that we live in. So if you're a church person, lean in just for a second. We take this externally focused culture and we religiously complicate it. We do more in order to have more so people will think more and say more about us. And here's what we do. We actually do that with our relationship oftentimes with God. Not only do we do more so that people around here might think and say more about us, but we actually think that somehow if we do more for God, we might end up having a better relationship with him so that perhaps he might even think better and maybe say more about us. Now, I would never get up on a stage and say to you, if you do more for God, then you'll have a better relationship with God and he'll think and say more about you. I would never get up and encourage people to do that. But for much of my life, I lived in my relationship with God and in my leadership in different ministry opportunities that I had with this kind of mindset. I would have never stood on a stage and said, this is what I do. But in practicality, on a weekly basis, day to day, I was oftentimes living out this kind of formula. If I just do a little bit more for God, then perhaps I'll have a better relationship with him and perhaps he might actually think and say more about me. And this formula, by the way, this worked for me for a long period of time. It actually worked. When I did more for God, it was amazing how I had more and more opportunities to do more for God. And more people thought more highly of me. This formula worked for me for a very long period of time. When I first started out in my ministry life, when I first started out in the church world, I began working for a Christian camp and conference center, which was the largest Christian camp and conference ministry in the world. They had camps and conference centers in over 85 countries around the world. Because I did more for God, they invited me to actually become the youngest ever director of their Christian camp and conference center in their headquarters in New York City. Because I was doing more, I was having more opportunities. And then I went from there and, and began to work in the for-profit world for a period of time as a, a vice president of business development. And here's what I discovered. If I did more, got on more airplanes, had more meetings with more people, and sold more product, it eventually led to me having more. And it eventually led to me having people say and think more of me. This formula worked for a long period of time for me. In fact, it led me to have the opportunity to be invited to become the lead pastor of a church in Colorado Springs. This church had been started about seven years prior to that, and the guy that started the church had done a phenomenal job, had gotten the church from meeting in a portable situation similar to this at a high school gymnasium and moved into their own facility, and after a number of years, the church had kind of flattened out and plateaued in growth, and so the church leadership decided it was time for a new leader to come in and help to grow the church to its next level. So who did they look for? Somebody that had grown things. And I had done more so that I could have more over many years and had become known as somebody that could help to grow organizations. So they invited me to come in and grow the organization. It was incredible. The first two years, my experience was phenomenal. We saw more than tripling in growth in attendance. We saw more than double the amount of people that got together during the week in what we called small groups or community groups that would meet in between weekends. 
And the giving, the generosity of this church skyrocketed, so much so that God used this church to begin a citywide movement of over 100 churches in Colorado Springs, uniting together to love the city with no strings attached. It was the most incredible experience. The growth was phenomenal. This doing more so that I could have more, so people would think more and say more about me, was working perfectly. The only problem is, externally things were great but internally my soul was imploding there was conflict within the church there was conflict specifically within the staff of the church so much so that it was such a toxic environment I'll never forget one night I was on a walk out with my wife in the neighborhood And I was literally talking to her about this conflict. I was so angry with God. Internally, things were imploding. Externally, things were exploding. But I took off my glasses in such fury and anger, and I snapped them, dropped an F-bomb at God, and threw them on the ground. See, externally, anybody looking at my life and ministry and leadership would have said, wow, things are going really well. But internally, I knew something was wrong. In that moment, when I threw my glasses on the ground, my wife turned to me and said something incredibly profound. I should listen to her way more often. She said, you know what? You need help. And I took that, and I finally said, I'm going to get some help. I was introduced to a guy named Lance Witt, who's become a friend and a mentor of mine And he introduced me to this concept, this idea of soul care. And Lance describes soul care like this. Here's how he describes it. He says it is tending to the garden of your inner life. Soul care is tending to the garden of your inner life. See, most of my life and leadership, I had been trained and and shown how to focus on how to harvest the forest of your external life, and I was really good at doing it. That's where most of my training and most of my focus had been. How do I harvest the forest of my external life? But nobody had really sat me down and said, Jason, I want to teach you how to tend to the garden of your inner life. Here's what I've discovered, and I think this is true for all of us. I've discovered that eventually the health of your internal life will eventually be revealed in your external life. Eventually, it may not be today, and maybe for you, you're sitting here saying, you know what, Jason, this this conversation is not for me because my external life is just fine, and I'm not dropping F-bombs at God, snapping my glasses, and throwing them on the ground. But eventually, your internal life, the health of it, will be revealed in your external life. I came across a story, a famous story of Jesus and his followers, and I know some of you are probably wondering, when are we going to get to the Jesus part? This is the moment, by the way. If so far you've been thinking, this sounds like a Tony Robbins kind of motivational speak, you're right, it probably is a bit like that. This is the Jesus part. So if you came to church and you're wondering, this doesn't seem like much of a talk about the Bible, this is the moment where we get into the Jesus part. There's a famous story of Jesus and his followers. If you're not familiar with Jesus uh, and his story, his followers were oftentimes called the disciples or they were sometimes called apostles. Maybe you've heard those kinds of terms. They were just the small band of guys that followed Jesus around. One of those guys, a, a guy named Luke, actually records for us all of the stories that happened while Jesus was alive and doing ministry in the first century. Luke was a doctor, and so because of that, he took painstaking detail and time and effort to record all of the stories, all of the things that happened, all the conversations that we have record of while Jesus was alive here in the first century. In this particular story, it highlights this tension, this issue of this external focus versus this internal focus. This idea of harvesting the forest of your external life versus tending to the garden of your internal life. 
And so this morning, before we get into this story that Luke wrote for us and recorded, I want to invite you to do something. If you're a church person or not a church person, old or young, doesn't make any difference, I want to invite you to do something during this story. I want to invite you to find a character in the story and imagine what they must have been feeling in this story. Imagine what they must have been feeling as we read the story, the account that Luke gives us of Jesus and these two women that were hosting them. Luke begins by saying this, as Jesus and the disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. This was typical of Jesus and his followers. They would travel on foot from village to village while Jesus was doing miracles, while he was healing people, while he was feeding people, while he was serving people. They would travel from village to village and they would oftentimes stay in people's home. Unlike religious leaders today who kind of like book out like the whole floor of a hotel downtown London for their big rally in the city, Jesus just stayed in people's homes. And I love this word, opened her home to Jesus, because that meant literally what's what's mine is yours. Come in and make my house your home. The story continues. Martha had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, at first glance in this story, It's easy for us to kind of skip over this part of the story. It's easy for us to kind of gloss over this part of the story. But Luke gives us some detail in here that I don't want you to miss this morning. Luke provides some detail that is super, super important. In the first century, Jesus was a rabbi, and anyone that was around their rabbi oftentimes wanted to be seated next to the rabbi on the left or the right-hand side of the rabbi. Because anybody else that was in that group would look at that person and think of them highly because they were sitting on the left or the right of the rabbi. Notice the detail that Luke gives us in this story. It says this, that Mary was actually sitting down at the feet of Jesus. Not so that people would take notice of how important she was, But notice the word after sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to her rabbi. Mary did something incredibly important in the story. She has positioned herself at the feet of Jesus so that she can listen to her rabbi. While that's happening, check out what Martha has to say. She had a sister called Mary, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. But Jason was distracted by all of the ministry and businesses that had to be grown. But Jason was distracted by all of the fundraising that needed to be done in order for us to love our city. But Martha was distracted by all of the preparations that had to be made. So much so that Martha was not only distracted, Martha was incredibly bold. Listen to the way that Martha, I don't don't know if you've been following Jesus a long period of time, a short period of time, or you're just checking out what this whole thing even looks like. Martha is incredibly bold, and she said some things that I'm not sure I could say to Jesus. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? And then Martha doubles down in the story. In the conversation with Jesus, Martha doubles down. Not only does she ask this very bold question, don't you care? But then she says, tell her to help me. See, Mary's just sitting at the feet of Jesus listening while Martha is distracted by all the preparations that had to be done. Jason was distracted by harvesting the forest of his external life and ignored the tending to the garden of his internal life. Listen to Jesus' response to Martha and her bold statements. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, 
You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. And then Jesus doubles down. Actually, indeed, only one thing. And then Jesus explains what that one thing is. He says this, that Mary, Mary has chosen, we'll go to the next slide, Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. I love the word that Luke uses here, the word better, because here's what it highlights for us. It highlights that Jesus is not saying that Mary has chosen the only thing that's important. She has just chosen what is better, what is priority. See, both things are important. What Martha is doing is important. What Mary is doing sitting at the feet of Jesus is important. But Jesus is just elevating and saying, actually, what Mary is doing is priority, even though both are important. I remember as I read this story, and really it opened my mind to to things I had never seen before. I remember turning to the whiteboard in my office in Colorado Springs and writing these words on the whiteboard. I just wrote, being with Jesus is actually greater than doing for Jesus. Being with Jesus is actually more priority than my doing for Jesus. Jesus summed it up in one of his most famous statements. Jesus summarized this whole thing when he said this. He used this garden analogy. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain or abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And then this powerful statement, apart from me, you can do nothing. Here's the summary. Here's what I've discovered, that my doing for Jesus, it must, it has to flow out of my being with Jesus. It must be the first work. My being with him must be the first work, and my doing for him must flow out of my being with him. Both are important. What Martha was doing was important, but Mary was doing something that was priority. Our doing for Jesus must flow from our being with Jesus. I want to give you just a short list of some things that have been incredibly helpful for me when it comes to being with Jesus. I liken these to kind of some gardening practices. These are things that position me to sit at the feet of Jesus on a regular basis and to listen to him. I want to share this list with you, but I I'm nervous about sharing the whole list with you because oftentimes when I share this with people, they immediately think to themselves, oh, here's another six things that I have to do for Jesus. The point of these practices are not for you to do more for Jesus. The point of the practices are simply to position you at the feet of Jesus. Silence and solitude has been a game changer for me. And even if you're not a church person, here's the good news. Even if you're not a follower of Jesus, everything that you're about to see on this list is something that you can participate in. Not only can you participate in it, but your counselor, if you went and spoke to them, they would say, these are good practices to help you with your mental health and your inner life. So even if you're not a follower of Jesus, this is a great thing to begin doing. This idea of silence and solitude, I remember the first time I ever sat down to just spend two minutes, just all of two minutes, 120 seconds, in silence and solitude. This extrovert and this doingaholic looked down at his his stopwatch, and all of 28 seconds had passed in my two minutes of silence and solitude for the first time. Here's what I would encourage you to, to consider doing. When you sit down to be with Jesus, to be quiet before him and just to listen to him, start small and focus on his incredible love for you. Just pause everything else that you're doing, get comfortable, sit quietly, and just spend two minutes soaking in God's love for you. I oftentimes use a phrase that I've stolen from the middle of the Bible, the book of Psalms, it says this, that your love is better than life. I use that phrase as I'm sitting in silence. 
alone with Jesus to just remind myself that his love for me is better than life. My wife loves to have a bath almost every night. She loves to just soak in the bathtub with a glass of wine. And I imagine myself just soaking in God's love for me. I pause in the morning. I typically pause a few times throughout the day to do this and just sit in silence and solitude. This has been a game changer for me. The next one is this practice or this concept called Sabbath. It's an old Jewish practice where they take a 24-hour period of time to just pause from any paid or unpaid work. They just pause to do no paid or unpaid work, and they use the entire day to delight in God's love for them. This is probably the practice that has been the most difficult for me to begin doing to tend to the garden of my inner life because, as I've mentioned already this morning, I was a -a doing-aholic. I loved watching things grow. I loved helping things to grow. And so this idea of stopping and resting and just delighting in God's goodness to me for an entire 24-hour period was one of the most difficult things for me to begin practicing. A friend of mine who encouraged me to begin the practice, he encouraged me, he said, Jason, what if you just started with just a four-hour period of time during the week where you didn't check your email, you didn't make that phone call, you didn't reply to that text, you just stopped all paid and unpaid work to rest and delight in God's goodness to you. I'll tell you, the four hours grew into six, then it grew into eight hours, 12, 24, and I'm just gonna warn you about the Sabbath. if, if, If this is some journey that you begin going on to begin practicing Sabbath, be careful of the Sabbath. It will take over your whole week. It's done that for our family. We plan for it all week long. We look forward to Sabbath because we get to stop, rest, and delight in God's goodness to us. And our identity is not in what we do or what we have, but in who God says we are in him. The next practice that's been incredibly helpful for me is just simply the practice of slowing down. Slowing down is kind of what I refer to as kind of like seasons for the garden of your soul. Instead of always picking the shortest queue at the grocery store, it's picking that one that's got a lot of people in it and actually asking them questions and getting them to get to know them a little bit and to extend God's love to them. This has been a huge help. It's picking the slower lane when you're driving down the motorway instead of always trying to find the fastest way somewhere, actually slowing down and experiencing God's love. The next one has been this idea of slow relational reading of scripture. For me, I grew up in a church tradition that taught you to kind of read through the Bible in the whole year. I remember getting my Bible each year and starting in January, checking off the boxes. I've read the Old Testament part of the Bible, then I'd read the New Testament part, and then I'd read the little Psalms and Proverb and check it off at the beginning of the year. And about 10 minutes after I read it, I didn't remember a single thing I had read, but I had checked off all the boxes. This idea of slow, relational reading of Scripture, smaller bites, longer consumption, slower consumption, smaller bites of Scripture, Not just reading scripture for information, but actually reading it for transformation where it begins to change who you are. This has been a game changer for me. Number five, simple living. Jesus was kind of like the first century minimalist. I don't know if you're into minimalism. I certainly haven't been for most of my life, but what I've discovered is that actually having less stuff and less things on my schedule has opened up time to tend to the garden of my inner life. And then finally, this last practice is gonna be a little bit, it's gonna seem unusual to you, but this is one that has been incredibly transformational for me. It's this idea, we'll go to the next slide, this idea of of leaning into sadness and sorrow. The broken parts of my life and the parts of my life that quite honestly, I try to avoid Quite honestly, when something happens, when I lose at something or when something doesn't go the way that I'd hoped it to go, I would quickly want to move on to something bigger and better. But just stopping to go through the process of processing my sadness, processing those losses in my life. There's an ancient Jewish practice called lament. 
And learning to lament has been incredible at tending to the garden of my inner life. Here's what I'd love to invite you to do as we wrap up this morning. As you look at this list of six things that are on this slide, my concern is that some people, the overachievers in the room, the dooaholics in the room like me, might take a picture of this entire list and think, this week I'm starting six brand new practices I've never done before. Here's what I'd like to invite you to do. Perhaps God has just kind of tugged at your heart because of one of these things that stood out to you. On this next slide, there's a QR code. I'd love for you to grab your phone again, and I'd love for you to scan that QR code that's up on the screen, the big one up on the screen above my head, and you can just pick one of those six practices on that QR code, and I would love to send you some follow-up information about what we've talked about today. Here's what I know to be true. A conversation like this doesn't change somebody's life immediately. You're not going to walk out of here and all of the sudden you're going to begin tending to the garden of your inner life and you've got soul care down pat because you sat through a 30-minute conversation on a Sunday morning. But what this could be, this could be the first step on a journey that you go on to begin to tend to the garden of your inner life and discover what it looks like to sit at the feet of Jesus on a regular basis. I'd love for everyone to look up this way as we wrap up our time together. I've got one last quote that I want to put up on the screen just to remind us of something that is true in our lives that I actually remind myself of every single day. It's a famous quote from one of my favorite authors, a guy by the name of Henry Nouwen. Nouwen says this about our identity. It's so different to what our externally focused culture says. He says this, that our spiritual identity means we are not what we do, we are not what we have, or what people say about us or what they think about us. We are the beloved sons and daughters of God. As we wrap up our time, I want to cement this truth deep within your heart. Even if you're not a church person, what this statement says is true about you as well. So here's what I want to invite you to do. This is going to be a little bit weird. I'm just going to call it out. It's going to be a little bit strange. I'd like for us to actually repeat this statement out loud. I'm going to start. And I want you just to repeat out loud after me. I'm going to start with, I am not what I do. And you're going to repeat that back. And then I've got two other statements that you'll repeat back. So you want to join me, Finch Hampstead Baptist, in repeating this truth to ourselves this morning. Here we go. I am not what I do. Say it back. I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what others think or say about me. I am a beloved child of God. Here's the bottom line. What if we made a flight plan for this year to care for our soul that focused less on what we need to get done and more on who God wants us to become? God, I pray God, I pray that you would take what has been said this morning, the conversation that has been had, and I pray that you would use it to shape and transform our lives into the people that you want us to become. God, I'm so grateful that you don't look at us and love us because of what we do or because of what we have or what other people think or say about us, but thank you that you love us because we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And I thank you for this truth, in Jesus' name, amen.